I want to thank everyone for showing up for this session. And I'm actually really cool that we're a small group because uh, I want to understand why uh, we have a non-conversation going on about this issue at SVN, about the fact that when we talk about diversity and inclusion, we're not really thinking about um, LGBTQ people who are part of this organization. And that has been important to me because every day in my job, I pitch SVN as a highly collaborative community. And as you know, being highly collaborative means being willing to engage in conversation and relationships with different people in the network, figure out if you can fund my, my idea to figure out if we might partner on something. But a lot of times that looks like like um, relating to like. So you look like me, um, we, I, who I understand you to be seems to be similar to me, then well let's, let's go ahead and collaborate. And I really want to wonder about difference. I want to wonder about collaboration across difference. And I want to wonder about a community that is trying to be very holistic in their approach, um, really thinking about the, the diversity of who's in the room at any given moment. So I'm really happy to be joined in this conversation by Jay Babalota, who is the executive director of the Australia Lesbian Foundation for Justice, and for Joe Steele, who runs Steele Consulting. And I am not going to introduce them. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. And what we're going to do is have a conversation. We have a couple of questions that we'd like to pose to you. Um, and I actually think it's appropriate, since we're such a small group, to, um, after you guys introduce yourselves, to actually go around the room and have people introduce themselves. And I'm actually very curious about what drew you here. Um, and so maybe that's how we'll begin. Right, I'm uh, Joe Steele, and uh, this is, I guess, put SVN and me in a context. Uh, I've known Marianne for many years, and in fact, uh, when Marianne was initially joining, I believe, SVN, Rhinebeck, New York, which is where you all had held one of your conferences, I guess, was back 2002, more or less, is when I first got sort of acquainted with SVN at the Omega Institute, exactly. And then I am also a good friend of Mark. Uh, from uh, Martha's Vineyard, so it's really uh, nice to sort of be in an environment where I already know folks. So that's a good news story because I guess in terms of what brings me into this conversation is how various aspects of our identity have meaning in relationship. So that's, I guess, what I'd be curious to hear from you uh, ar uh, around this topic too, and particularly around from the standpoint of we're really talking about sexual orientation and then also gender identity from a transgender perspective to an um, and so, I guess bottom line is having very quickly done my little bit of research last night from an SVN standpoint, I guess there were two things that stood out because needless to say, people were curious, why are you here, what are you doing here? And so I really got into this conversation around, well, first of all, I'm part of the panel, right, with, with Bob, and we're doing LGBTQ, and there was a both and reaction. There was an enthusiasm that it was Yet, it was, it was left with me to have any follow-up questions, i.e., um, you know, why do you think there's having a panel here? Uh, what's your sense of, you know, uh, people's comfort and quote-unquote being out, whatever that might look like in the community? Um, personally, no one really followed up with any questions around, are you married? Um, you know, who might be your partner? So it was just sort of interesting. So I just want to say it because it's a both and in this. There was a... Uh, happiness that is happening, yet I felt like it was a combination of either you don't know what you don't know and or just a lack of interest in sort of finding out anything else. So I guess I'm sort of saying this because this is a great opportunity for me to get a little more clarity around what might be going on in the community with this topic and then also to figure out, you know, how I might be of, you know, sort of value in our little bit of time together. Because bottom line, one of the biggest th things I have for my own, I guess, wrestling with how to be in relationship with people around my sexual orientation specifically is constantly being left in meeting new people. Um, and I travel all over the world for my work. 
um, is inevitably I'm going to have to make a decision. Do I come out or don't I? And by coming out, it's as, it's as simple as answering the second or third question. It's because it generally starts, particularly here in the U.S., with total strangers. Um, are you married? And I wear a wedding band. Okay? So, uh, well, yes. And I immediately know with that question, okay, I'm going to be coming out to this total stranger in a matter of like a, a few more questions if they pursue this. The next one is generally, um, what does your wife do? <laughs> particularly if I'm traveling, right? The assumption goes to the heterosexual default. Now I'm like, okay, I'm really going to be out because, you know, uh, Glenn, my partner, he's, you know, a teacher and a artist. So in three questions, you're out. And, and it varies. And I sort of say this because part of it is the stress of do I come out or don't I come out? And then also not knowing what the ramifications might be in terms of something as simple as just safety, um, ease of uh, contained interest. The good news is that for the most part, I finally got to the point and this is, I guess, the last thing I want to say, just as an opening, is I've gotten to the point of I'm not as defensive with the comment of I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> because that <laughs> one, <laughs> you know, I've gone from, you know, I. I would have brought coffee. <laughs> 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 you know, and I've finally gone, gotten from, you know, uh, I don't need any praying. I don't you be praying for me. <laughs> to, um, actually now asking the question, what are you praying for? And that's really where I've like found a little more dialogue and it's really taken me to another level because it's all over the place from like, you know, saving you from the devil um, right through to hoping, you know, you're not going to pass away like some of my friends may have passed away from age related issues, etc. So really, so I just want to say it because bottom line is there is a willingness to still be in that conversation and there's still that biggest fear I have is how quickly I have to make the decision, do I come out or don't I, and the ramifications of that. Good morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, hi, my name's Bob Alota. Um, I am, in fact, the executive director of the Estrella Foundation, and um, s let me tell you a little bit about Estrella, and then, um, and then why I might be here. Um, uh, so Estrella is uh, the only foundation solely dedicated to funding LGBTQI activism, both in the U.S. and around the world. Um, we've been in existence uh, over 35 years. We have funded in 81 countries and 43 states. Um, we fund, um, uh, one thing that's very important to us is that we often fund nascent or emerging groups. What that means is there's pretty much, no, there, there are no <laughs> almost, um, uh, LGBT groups um, that, when they started, did not get a grant from Australia. Um, and, and that is just actually real. Um, and uh, we prioritize lesbian leadership, trans leadership, and people of color leadership um, from the vantage point that the most marginalized voices need to be brought to center. Um, uh, we don't necessarily have an investment in center, we have an investment in the most marginalized voices. Um, uh, we um, we're a public foundation. So what that means is that we raise all of the money that we grant. Um, it also means um, it's my job to have a whole lot of hustle. But it, it, it also means that we bring a lot of stakeholders into the room. Um, and that I really see that as what it means to, to run a public foundation. So we raise money from private foundations, from individuals. Um, and uh, for the first time, actually, uh, when, when Obama declared LGBT rights human rights, and then, uh, and then, then um, Secretary Clinton did the same. You know that was code for there's going to be, f there has to be, in fact, foreign policy money that's invested in LGBT rights. And I spent a, a year and a half negotiating that deal. And we are uh, Stray is the first implementing uh, and uh, resource partner um, uh, for USAID investment in LGBT rights. Um, um, my my background, I'm a filmmaker um, and a technologist and um, in, or I should say I'm a Luddite in a technologist costume. <laughs> um, and um, uh, so I, um, I have a 20 plus year career in film and new media. I was running a new media production company before I um, came on board at Estrella. Prior to that, I was the director of digital technology at Columbia University. My activism would one day um, be my job, nor did it ever occur to me that I'd be gay for pay. 
Um, and that's a whole other hospitality suite. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, <laughs> I'm just trying to tell you, 11 a.m., I don't know what's wrong with you people, but, um, but, uh, so, um, but I'm here because I think I'm one of the more innovative um, leaders in business, and so that's what I actually thought this conference was about. Um, I, um, I took over for a founding director who was running the foundation for over 27 years, and prior to collective because it was a lesbian or run organization. And, um, and uh, so what, so I really, um, my first SVN the spring in San Diego, um, I had been in a Rockwood cohort with Deb and she was like, you should come to this thing. And I was like, I really don't understand what it is. And I was, tr I was listening, listening, listening. And I was like, okay, it's capitalist Ted. Like, I don't, what is it? And, um, and then, but I was like, okay, I'm down. I I'm just going to put it in my calendar. And, uh, in our family, we have, like, we're scheduled within an inch of our lives, uh, myself, my partner, and, and our daughter. Um, and so I thought I put it in my calendar, but then I realized I put it in my partner's calendar, and I couldn't erase it for some reason. So I called Toshi, and I'm like, hey, I'm sorry. I made a mistake. I put this thing in your calendar. It's in San Diego. And she was just like, no, that's my calendar. I'm singing at that. Like, what do you mean? And so it was we both were going to this thing in San Diego, which is the only time we saw each other all last year, so it was great. Um, and, and so, so the, here we both were, and, um, and so I was really struck by um, um, the breadth of, so for me, walking into philanthropy um, uh, two plus years ago, was mind-boggling, because I came at it, because I would never have done that if it weren't a struggle very specifically about um, the integrity of this organization um, funding ra radical possibility, right? That fun funding movements in to any kind of change. And I'm queer, right? I'm, uh, and so there's a personal identification, but, but I don't de facto go to gay things, right? I don't de facto. It's, it actually has to... Um, there are more checklists, uh, you know, check boxes for me. Like it actually, Australia was funding a level of activism that I, I saw as game changing. And that really appealed to me and that's why I would make a fairly phenomenal career change. In the context of SVN, um, I, I, um, what I hear a lot of narratives around um, responsibility inside of, uh, what it means to push open or break away the walls of doing things about the way that we presuppose things need to be done. Um, and so when I was really excited to, you know, after sort of experiencing last year, um, um, show tunes and all, I really, um, I was like, okay, what, what, why would I get asked? And it was really about looking at one philanthropy of uh, disparate flows of capital. So, you know, how is it done, right? That's the, <laughs> the semicolon. <laughs> and, um, and really, what does it mean to build an institution that had pre-existent walls and have to remake those walls based on um, it being 2030? And um, what is the most radical of being able to... Uh, and I don't care who's running the ship, and I don't care... Who vantage point of came to it as uh, a queer practitioner but as a practitioner um, and station like um, if we're going to uh, then then uh, we're one of the players who should be having that conversation regardless On me. Um, so I'm just wondering if there's anyone in the room who wants to share, um, like, what drew them here, if there was something that was sort of pressing for them uh, that landed them here. Uh, my name is Mary Ann Howland, and I'm president and CEO of IBIS Communications and founder and CEO of the Global Diversity Leadership Exchange. 
and do a lot of work in the space of diversity and inclusion on a global scale. So this topic was fascinating because I work with corporate clients, but I'm really here because Joe and I go way, 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 way back. And it's like really cool to kind of see him sitting in that chair, you know, be an authority figure, because I can tell you stories. But, um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but um, my question is, in dealing with corporate America and diversity and inclusion, and for corporate corporations define that as African American, Hispanic, Asian, LGBT, veterans, women. When I looked at the guide, the description of this session, it said LGBTQ. And that was the first time I had ever seen that. And so I went, oh, okay. You know, so I wanted to, my question is I want to understand is this, what is the Q? What does that mean? Is that the new, you know, correct, socially correct, politically correct acronym? And has that been used in corporate America and what's been a response to that? Because that's taking it to another level. So, um, I'll speak to that. Thank you for asking that question. Um, so uh, we, um, so Q stands for queer. We, um, it's a American and Western um, notion. So actually we don't use it globally. Um, we use LGBTI, which intersex. Um, but but we, we very purposefully, um, we, we make the most number of grants in the global south. Just do grant making, I, I should deeply say that. Um, and I, I can talk about the other work uh, more later, but it, it's very much about being um, conscious of not imposing a, a Western uh, ideology on anyone else. And so um, it's a very, it's actually a very American, or I would say North American, Phenomenon. Um, uh, you, it also in throughout I would in Latin America and South America, but it is not um, as much in Africa or uh, South Asia. And so, um, uh, and it also is a term that has, in the United States, had uh, in the 90s had a, a huge um, following <laughs> or meaning or community. Then stopped, and you know it's sort of it, it's t it's taken on different meanings at different times. So um, uh, I think from a sustainability place, uh, it's not, I don't know that I would be so concerned about it being politically, politically correct, but that more so that it exists and, or we exist and um, people identify in, inside of, it's more about a movement space, um, less so about uh, the need for like, you know, I make a joke that about the alphabet soup all the time, right? Like I, I, there, I'm, I say L M N O P. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm just like, okay, look. <laughs> but um, but you know, I think it th there's that fine line between really, I want to honor who you say you are, right? And and just do it right. You know, it's not even, and also to be, it's okay to not know what, what it means or what the answer is or how anyone necessarily identifies. You know, I think the only quick thing I want to add to the. Uh, how sexual orientation covers the, it has so many intersectionalities, and I guess queer makes me think of this, because from, I'm a baby boomer, so uh, queer to me was not okay, uh, back to beyond political correctness. It was a derogatory thing, et cetera, whereas with younger folks, queer is, a, you know, to your point, I mean, it's not super common, but depending on the, the, the spread, common language. So I guess, I guess I'm saying this to say, my invitation is just to sort of be in the, you refer to yourselves. For example, um, here at the conference, one of the things that you know, I had heard was uh, in, in, in a ways to be inclusive of bringing in the fact that there's various sexual orientations, the word sexual preference being used. And I had to catch myself because, again, my first reaction was preference implies choice, which I've got some real issues around. And on the flip side, I was just thankful that someone even brought it in. So I'm just sort of saying it, so how to sort of be with evolution and what does word choice mean to you? Because the other piece of Q that I'm hearing in some organizations is also Q being questioning. Um, and and in particularly, again, back to generational, I do think that people are, you know, particularly some of the younger folks, my sense, are a bit more willing to explore where they might be on that sexual continuum than the age of baby boomer. So, so what does Q mean to folks, I guess, would be the other thing I'd be asking if it's used. 
most youth yeah. use use two two, and they mean queer and questioning. Wow. I mean, also because you're 12, and yeah. I hope you're questioning, <laughs> right? Do you know what I mean? Like, you, like so, that's. Yeah. My name's Mark Watson. I'm on the board here. I just want to move this conversation in two different areas. One, I read a report on philanthropy mm -hmm. and how. Excuse me, Mark, if you're going to move it, there was a question here. I don't know if it was related. I'm sorry. To that or if it was yeah. something else. Well, it was about why we're here on this panel. Oh, okay. So. And this, this, this dovetails with your question. I'm happy to pass it over. But there was a report about how little the broader philanthropic community supports LGBTQ issues. Yes. And I wonder if you would address that and, and how we might support that as members of SVN. Yeah. And the second question, and Joe, you might, <clears throat> how do we make it matter that we're in this room? I mean, it's nice to be able to acknowledge who you are, but what relevance can that have for SVN or other member? So um, of, of overarching philanthropic dollars and, and Shame on me for not remembering the, the billions number, but depending on which report you read, 0 0.6, I, there's, there are a number of reports, but they range from 0 0.3, 0 0.6, and 0.7 percent of philanthropic dollars go to LGBT causes. Um, that's a paltry number. Um, and so um, when I was saying that we do more than just grant making, so grant making is obviously a core of the work we do, um, another core tenet of our work is philanthropic advocacy, and that is very much about um, uh, to bring more money into the sector. Um, and um, I'm the co-chair of something called the Global Philanthropy Project, which is, whose mission is also to, to do that. And, that. and I sit on that, it, um, that's with Ford, Arcus, Wellspring, OSF, I'm, uh, all of the heavy hitters in philanthropy and anyone who, who invests in international LGBT. Um, work and w and um, the the function of that is to really um, across the board to try to raise resource um, from both the corporate sector and individuals from other philanthropic institutions. Um, you know, Australia pos posits itself as a racial justice institution. Period. I mean, we're we're people of color led. We're largely people of color driven, but it's also about the fact that. Um, we can't be doing the work that we're saying we're doing and not saying we're a racial justice uh, organization, nor can we say we're, nor can we not say we're an economic justice organization, right? And so, um, and so I think in terms of, uh, in this space, when we're talking about um, innovation, sustainability, um, radical possibility, all of, the, all of the things that we hear uh, about, um, uh, I'll give you an example. Like, we heard from a young man yesterday who was like, I didn't, we knew nothing about Uganda, and we knew nothing about shoes, right? But we wanted to have an impact in this particular place. Um, and, and um, or we have heard, and on the flip, we heard, we knew, we, wa we, knew, we know about beer, and we want to create a beer company, but we want to create a beer company that does all these things that we're told companies can't. Right? We're told companies can't be owned by its workers. We're told um, um, sort of the laundry list of things that were kind of amazing, like breaking down the, w the presumption of structure and actually being successful inside of that. And so, and so to your point about investment, I think that there's two, there's two ways to go. You can talk about the fact that these lives matter and that if we're going to talk about the totality of humanity, you have to invest in the totality of lives period. So if you're having any kind of philanthropic engagement, it must include LGBTQI people, LMNOP. Or, um, and uh, you can say, if in fact, um, if you want to invest in um, the most radical practice, this is also another sphere when you, where you can do that. Because when we look at uh, what are the benchmarks, and y'all could tell me better than I could, but when, when, if you're a global business and you're looking to see what the benchmarks of possibility for success are in across the, um, either the states, cities, towns, or countries, or global markets where you want to um, invest or have, a, or have uh, your company reside, I can assure you that 
the conditions under which women and LGBT people are living are barometers for the possibility of your business succeeding, period. And so, um, and look at who has known that to be true. Google, right? IBM, much more radical than, than, uh, than Google in their practice, um, just less outspoken about it. Um, uh, JP Morgan, interestingly enough, Chase. Um, in terms of their, their internal diversity practice and the implementation in the environments where they work. Um, I, I went to my, I came before my last uh, SVN, and then I'll stop talking. Um, uh, I had come from India, where I was, you know, they just passed a law, 2% of corporate social responsibility is meant to go, um, I mean, 2% of net profit is meant to go to corporate social responsibility. And I was there in a sort of think tank to imagine how some of that money could go LGBT way. And the first day was with, was with Chase and IBM, Accenture, Citibank, blah, 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 Google. And then the, and the next two days were with all of the Indian multinationals. And, uh, you know, my idea was in order for, and we can talk about they're creating that law to get actually Western money out of the country and it's corrupt. Okay, all of those things. But um, my idea was, okay, let's set up a fund where they're compliant by virtue of putting their money into the fund. They don't have to create their own CSR department. And they say where they want to direct that money. And we don't actually have to say, you must direct that money to women's issues, to gender equality, to LGBT issues. But you're, you're guaranteed that if you put your money through this fund, you're compliant. The fee for that is high, but much cheaper than a CSR department. And that money gets put towards gender equality and LGBT issues. Right? So, so what I'm, what I'm, how I'm answering your question is the investment has to happen because people care, and then the, or either about the people, the lives, or the possibility, about the democratic possibility, about the fact that it's simply a good idea, or because we figure out how to use their money in another way to, get it in, to invest in the things that we think are important. And, and do the work, bec and that's an, uh, that can happen sooner, and we do the concurrent work to change the landscape. I'm gonna get to you, Imani, but I just had to pause a minute because I need to revisit that list of who's investing in LGBT, because ain't none of those companies in this room. And in fact, they're companies that we would probably look at their business practices and have a lot of questions about them, and rightly so. And yet, I wonder about who's taking the lead in our space around these issues. Who's actually willing to put part of their profits towards supporting LGBT organizations, um, understanding and supporting the things that their LGBT employees think are important to support, um, what level of awareness there is that that's actually an incredibly vital benchmark for what it means to do good in the world. Um, and in particular for companies that do have a global reach because, uh, you know, you can fool yourselves and measure things by North America, but the minute your products are leaving this country, you really have to think much more broadly about what the impact would be if you had any kind of LGBT initiative or consciousness about where your products are going. So I, that's, I mean, I'm so glad you raised that because that's one of the things, that's an absence, I think, in our conversations about what the possibility of doing good looks like. Uh, what the range of benchmarks are. When we say people, what are we talking about? Who are we talking about? Uh, and is there a commitment uh, within that to thinking about who's differentially empowered? You know, who, who has access to power, who doesn't? Um, who has initiatives that need to be funded? Um, you know, Sierra Club is great. 
Um, you know, there are also a lot of other organizations that deal with social issues that are great. And I think it's moving a conversation that Mark started actually yesterday with our public policy uh, conversation, what it means to think about people in a much more complex way. Uh, and, and I think it's a failing of us right now. And I think it's something that we really need to have in our conversation. So I'm going to stop lecturing. And Imani. Um, my name is Imani Missouri. I came because I was excited that there was a, a panel or discussion like this. And I'm, I'm one of the bees in the LGBT. And um, I recently started an organization that I'm going to make public at some point this fall called Biaspora. Because I feel like um, the bee is silent. All, I mean, it's like it's just thrown in. Like, it's not really represented. Really, it's just like it's just there because it's politically correct to be there, and so I'm a vocalist and composer and a culture worker. So I kept trying to figure out how can I, how can I help make my visibility a real thing and not just like in the alphabet soup, as it were. So I just wanted to represent as bi. I am bi. I'm officially here as bi. <laughs> I also use queer too. I like queer, but I bi. I just like because it's, it's in the alphabet. And, um, I just wanted to make sure some bi out bi people were part of the conversation. So that's what I came. Share it with Denise, and we'll move it around. And I don't want to just because that's a big that's issue. It, it is. Because by is, it gets back. It, it really gets back to this whole notion of who tends to run the conversations. Mm -hmm. and, um, and and from a male standpoint, it's quite often men. And then from a racial standpoint, it's quite often white gay men who are sort of you know a lot of times sort of leading this conversation. And that's a real challenge around how the other components because. It's really a disparate group that's put together on this alphabet. Uh, and so I say that to say, while definitely from an external perspective, the work needs to be done in support of what does that look like, even amongst our own. It's hard for the college show to have shoes. So by one in particular that I know I personally have to even, uh, in my own conversations, uh, have to catch myself around passing judgment, pick or choose. <laughs> <laughs> Right, as opposed to being with the fact that you know that's how they identify, and what does that mean to them, as opposed to the meaning I give it. So thank you. For the um, I just I wanted to start with identifying an opportunity after your rant, and uh, <laughs> I think the reality of the SBN community is, is we're really small and medium-sized companies. You know, a Ben and Jerry's and Seventh Generation; those are medium-sized companies in the state things. And when you talk about the kind of policies that you're seeing, the chase, and et cetera. These are global behemoths, and as a result, they have the capacity to have policy and uh, mindfulness about it just by nature of their scale. And we lack the time and attention. There's still a lot off the corner of the desk for many of the brands here. And, and I think there's a huge opportunity in bringing that roadmap and bringing some of those tools and saying, this is what it looks like. This is what it could look like in your employee handbook. And I think it's just been a forgotten, you know, forgotten aspect of it. So I think there's a huge opportunity for the SBM community to just formalize and create some discipline around this conversation within our workplace. And that's what I, I just want to lay a little bit of context of, of why I came and, and you know, people here can answer it. Yeah, I'm an entrepreneur, I have 10 staff. I live in Vancouver, my co-founder and I are both clear, we both have families. And it's been really interesting to figure out how to date like the conversation in our own workplace. So we have a pretty diverse workplace and what I, uh, the unintended consequence of that, uh, I realized last year, when we hired a, you know, an intern from Bangladesh and our bookkeeper is a fairly new immigrant from China, is we kind of have some conservatism in the office that that I didn't expect. And uh, and so how are we having those conversations? And I think of how as a small business owner, I onboard my staff, what my interview questions are. We have a, a, a value around walking the talk. And for me, that's all about sustainability. And I was joking with you last night about how I kind of want everybody to ride a bike. And that's like my indicator of, of you know the value set I want, and, and what a ridiculous thing. But uh, you know, it, it's it's hard to know how to daily like, conversations as we bring people in to, to at least like say look at our at our next staff event. You're going to meet a whole sort of thing that maybe you haven't met before. And and do you daily? And what do those conversations look like? And how do you create that space in a small business to have those conversations when it's not really your day job? Um, you know, it's we're working on green products, and anyway, so it's just it's kind of this conundrum that I feel like I face as a small business owner. I'm just curious to hear folks' thoughts on what you know, what does it look like to hire people? What does that process look like where you start the conversation? Then I think we could do a better job. I'd kind of love to hear 
Thank you, first of all, for having this panel and um, having us all here. I came to this session for a lot of reasons. So, um, my name is Stephanie. I live right here in Baltimore. And I have a law firm, small law firm. And we represent, provide legal representation to children in foster care. And so, we represent kids zero to the age of 21. And um, we're in five counties in the state. And the majority of our clientele are African American. This is a largely African American city. And so, having said that, the kids that we represent are already on the margins because they're in foster care. The next piece is they have multiple identities, right? I mean, they're African American, um, some come from impoverished backgrounds, most. Um, and then sexuality is an issue. Some identify lesbian, gay, some bi, um, some gender non conforming. And I think that, um, like I said, Guru said, I go into the darkest of places. That's where I work, right? So I'm in the prisons. I'm working with a lot of trauma, a lot of pain. That's where I go. That's where I go. So what I'm really finding is that, um, number one, on a very micro level, I want to be able to respect who I'm working with. That's very important. I want to be able to teach my staff how to work with people who may not identify the same as they do. Mm -hmm. And on a, on a macro level, I want to, number one, in the courts, in a larger sense, be able to effectively deal with this population and then impact policies that impact this population. So I'm here really to learn um, a lot. And um, I think that. One of the very basic things that we do, it doesn't matter whether we identify the same sexually or racially or any of those things. It's just meeting people with a level of respect, humanity, and dignity that they deserve. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that that's very hard. And, and some of the things that I feel very challenged with is that people don't meet people with that basic fundamental mm -hmm. It doesn't matter that you're very different, but you know, you're you're a human being. I'm looking in your eyes and I want to say hello and, and, and treat you with the humanity, dignity, and respect that you deserve. So I'm here to really learn more about um, how to actually incorporate that in the work we do. And also I'm looking at larger initiatives that possibly would be able to fund to work specifically with this population. <coughs> Thank you, Stephanie. That's so that's so beautiful and so well said. Because I think, I mean, going back to what Donna was saying, um, I think part of this conversation that you really started with having this group is how do we really be our full human selves, right? And when we don't have you know, queer identities, LGBTI folks, even to recognize, you know, on the one hand, we have all this rhetoric and this course around wanting human well-being everywhere and really wanting to work for a just, humane world. But how do we do that if we don't even acknowledge existence of certain people, so and different types of lifestyles. I think in terms of going back to the question that was posed, that what can we do as small and medium-sized enterprises, and how can SVN really lead the charge in making our communities more inclusive? And this is like worldwide. There are folks here from Ireland. Here I'm sorry, Canada. I just want to just double check. Being a World Trade Center survivor. Is that just the cannons firing yeah. from the ship? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to New York myself. So I agree with all of that. I grew up in Brooklyn. I was like, oh, no, no. Let's keep on talking. That's just every day. Right. Yeah. 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 Every day. Okay. Yeah. 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 Do you need someone to hold your hand? No. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay. Well, what I was really saying was that I think this is an opportunity to really lead the charge on two ways. I mean, of course, we always kind of focus on what can we do? How can we have more money? How can we have more profits? And how can we go to LGBTI causes? Well, the, f the point is there are currently, you know, in the queer community, there are certain causes out there that are supporting LGBTI issues. But they're not comprehensive. Like, you know, there's so many missing links. So even if we were to say, let's we're going to donate two percent of our profits to LGBTI causes, we actually need innovation in that space. So like, 
I mean, that's one thing that we really need to focus on. That first, okay, let's dedicate some funds to do this work in the charitable and philanthropic sector, but then also really, really, really foster innovation there because you know not just here but globally. And the second that I think every business at SVN and member can really do is incorporate practices. I think that marketing materials are so big in terms of being inclusive. And not just writing that we don't discriminate, you know, just the legal, the legalese. I'm an attorney, so I know the legalese around it. But showing pictures of, like, you know, queer families, of, you know, trans men, trans women, like, living happily and being included and thought of as human beings as we talk about a just humane world. And that would make such a huge, huge, you know, even just a statement, and it's symbolic, but I think the implications of that would be huge. And similarly, like, just around the, you know, the motions of employment, I think there's possible um, collaborations and partnerships that could be had with existing organizations that do, like, you know, LGBTI advocacy on how to suggest to small and medium-sized enterprises to make their internal policies more inclusive what types of questions they can ask when they're asked, you know, when they're interviewing applicants. How can you make them a comfortable? And how can all these businesses be a place where you can be out and okay with it? And I think this is where the soul searching really needs to begin. It's like, hey, SVN folks, like we really care about just and humane world, but are we willing to look inside our own homes and be like, hey, we're gonna welcome it for everyone, including gay people or people that don't conform to everyday heteronormative um, expectations that we have. So I think there's that opportunity, f but I think the leadership really has to come with SVN. And I think the folks here can totally support that. You know, but you know, it has to be commitment, and I think that could really, really be transformative for SMEs that are members. Hi, my name is Julian Gender, and I came today because I'm a big fan of having difficult conversations. And I'm a straight white male, so this is something that I am very interested in in terms of how I can help create inclusion at SVN. And I'm also interested in how I can help trying to discover a career of how I can work with companies and organizations to create systems that are inclusive and healthy and where people can be their full selves and achieve to their fullest potential. And I think that will affect companies on the bottom line and it will affect people's daily lives and I just think that's the way to go. So I came to explore that with you. Um, thank you for that. So there were a couple of questions. I mean, Denise, you literally had a question about like how are people um, sort of dealing with issues of diversity within their organizations and I, I wondered if anyone has um, an initiative or has been working on this within their organization that might have something to share? I was going to catch you afterwards. And so um, it, it, it's, I, I have to say this, it's not, f for me, it, it, it had not been about so much of the physical diversity but the mental diversity, right? So, um, I have created a particular structure that when I interview incoming staff, um, particularly attorneys who are gonna work front line, that there are certain issues that are very important to me politically that I really want to be able to um, understand their thinking process around it, whether or not they're aware of it. Even if they're not aware of it, how would they approach certain issues? So I have like a three-part piece to my interviewing process. You know, the first piece is, is, is just kind of a getting to know you. And they have several rounds of interviews, right? So the, the first piece is a little bit about getting to know you individually. But the second piece really focuses on certain social justice issues. And I will ask questions in a broad way that does not um, violate the law to get at their thinking. <laughs> yeah, that's the, I kind of, so I mean, yeah, right, so we could talk about that, you know, and you tailor it to your business, you tailor it to your business. And, and then I do this kind of practical application to the law stuff, right, but, um, and then I do a moral um, values piece. I do a values piece, because I wanna know what their values are too, and those values hook into that whole uh, kind of social justice mindset, and it's really helped me tremendously that I think that I've brought, I've, I've brought um, on my staff 
I think, very diverse thinkers in a lot of ways. So if you want to talk more specifics about it, I'll be more than happy to do that with you. Yeah, if you could say one thing that, that um, your question, I think, laid a little bit bare for me, is that you're really dealing with the issue of diversity as opposed to the issue of inclusion, which I actually think are really different things. And I think that the, uh, this idea of inclusion uh, doesn't necessarily presume a, a truly changed landscape. Whereas a diverse landscape is simply a diverse, is in fact a diverse landscape. And, and if, if I may, you know, um, when we're talking about actually people living in their f power or being their f full selves, and, and I, I forgot which one of you said, but a healthy environment, and I think that that's really, really critical when we're looking at the holistic possibility of all of the work that we can do, right? Whether it's the tenor of our individual um, businesses or organizations or the work that we're creating out into the world. And when, when you're talking about uh, um, inclusion, I, I, there's a presumption that there's not been a change in the power dynamic, right? The presumption is whatever the norm is, you can be here too, right? But the norm's not going to change because we're going to include you into here and here is just fine, except you should be here, because I, I think I just learned that you should be here too. Whereas a diverse world and a diverse organization is made up of many different And that's harder. Um, and, and that's real. You know? and, it's and I don't think it's, there's anything wrong with saying we need to be really fun. There's baseline things we need to share, right? A commitment at the very least, to the work we're doing, right? Like, you need to have a work ethic, and you need to be able to be dedicated, and you need to do all of those things. But you're also going to bring in some culture um, that I'm not aware of, and it might make me feel uncomfortable. And if I'm committed to diversity, I'm going to figure out how to deal with that. However, I also need you to figure out how to deal with that, too. And as the leader of that organization, I have to figure out how to create an environment where we're dealing with each other, right? And so that's... And, that, and that's a management uh, onus, you know? It, and it really is, and it's not easy. Like, I, I, I struggle with it quite a lot, actually, um, you know, for different, for different kinds of scenarios, but that's certainly come up. Um, and, and I think that that's, there are a lot of people here who do um, organizational development, and either de facto or that's their job, and I think that that's actually a big, I'd love to see that inside of an SVN frame to really talk about um, uh, are we changing? Are we changing the the power structures inside of our organizations, or let's just own whether we're not interested in that? You know, actually, I like this chair, and I'm not giving it up. I'm willing to have two other chairs over there, and that's it's going to be filled with X and Y. But this chair's not moving, and I I'm, I just want to tell the truth, right? Or one day you're going to be sitting in my chair. And that's okay, and I'm okay with it, right? And those are different, and they're real. And so I think that that actually is just worth knowing and taking that kind of temperature read. And then you can figure out what kind of, and it's not going to be the same for everybody, right? But then you can at least know where, what room you're in, right? The, um, uh, I have, have a lot of elders in my life, and um, uh, one, and I was talking about some of the duplicity that exists inside of philanthropy, right? That I'm so sick of having conversations with people who are in these billion dollar organizations and they're acting like it's their billion dollars. <laughs> and the truth is, they're not trying to actually make change. They are trying to manage up, right? And so I, I can't change how they're inside of their institution, but I would really like to know what conversation we're having, right? Like, I just wanna know. Like, are you gonna, am I, are we going to work something out and does it have to be on your terms so that you can tell your boss it's X, Y, and Z and so you're gonna say this whole movement needs this thing, this one thing, so that I can give you this dollar fifty, right? Is that the conversation we're having? Just tell me, right? But, but, um, but she said to me, and I was like, you know, uh, it was a couple of Jamesons in, and so she said, uh, <laughs> she said, this is what Fannie Lou Hamer told me, always know what room you're standing in. And, and I certainly hope that room changes, that you're in different rooms. You should never be in the same room. You, 
you, you should know what side you're on, but you should never be in the same room, but know where you stand. And I think that that's really important, and I think it's okay, and I think it's okay for when we're trying to do hard work and we're evolving, that we're, that we're just honest, you know? And so it's not, shaming is not gonna do us very well in this particular conversation, it just isn't. And so it's like really okay, like I live in a, maybe you live in a place where uh, it's not gonna, diversity is gonna look really different in X place and Y place and, and that's fine. But if, but, and it might be diversity of thought, it might be uh, a, a really diverse gender spectrum and it might be culturally, racially, uh, age diverse. It might, you know, all of those things are possible um, and you need to know what is just in fact true. But I think in terms of this context and trying to imagine the possibility, there's a level of honesty it, ju it just requires. And I personally am a little more cynic. I'm sorry. The irony of this community, and, and for me, my, like, my little kind of blinders off moment recently is that I lead a change-making organization. All day long, my team thinks about worker rights in factories and the materials stuff we're made from. And that's what we do all day long. And it's, and it's just kind of ironic as this company that's led by two queer women that we just really haven't thought about that conversation. And I think that's part of the ESPN communities. We're with a group of people that are fighting their fight. And it's just daylighting that um, you don't need to go and fight another fight. Like, I don't think anyone here is, I'm not going to, we're not going to become an activist organization around these issues. That's not my unique space in the world. I do what I do. But how do I do the bigger picture better? How do I start to bring the broader conversation? And I think that's kind of our potential gift to this organization, is to go out there and say, yeah, organic food is important. It's damn important. Let's have a few other like conversations so that your you know your consciousness is just a little broader and your employee manual is just a little broader and those questions on your interview script is just a little broader. So that I think that's I, like, like it's just a conundrum I think for the organization because you're talking to change makers and there's just this kind of these ironic gaps. Yeah. And just system. quickly, the only yeah. thing I wanted to sort of say is I sort of see diversity and inclusion sort of integrated, uh, both ends. I say this because let's just use LGBTQ I, right, which is my learning, the I just today, is um, the importance of like helping people get what's the relevance to be in conversation. Because the organization that you spoke of, uh, what stands out with an IBM, a JP Morgan Chase, depending, um, is a function of who's running the show. So let's bring this back to SVN. So if you have a leader running the show who really feels that there is a relevance to have this piece of people demographic incorporated into the way we are and the way we coexist, the people will follow suit. Okay, if the leader of the show is not even bothering to speak to it, you can forget about it uh, for the most part. Um, and I, I love the power idea and the sharing power. I'm personally, uh, again, this is my own cynicism, so I'm gonna own this. I'm yet to meet too many folks who feel like I've got enough power, I'm gonna give you some too. I mean, I think that's just an ongoing struggle is how do you grow the pie instead of fighting over a sliver. So if I'm starting with we're still fighting over a sliver, I still have to meet people where they are and where I may even be still on certain occasions. So I just sort of say but leadership sets the tone. Um, and with, for, for example, employee resource groups, a lot of your bigger companies are using this as a vehicle to bring various elements of diversity. And I'm saying diversity because the other thing I'm pushing individuals to do in organizations, name what we're talking about. I am so sick of the word diversity, I can't freaking see straight. Like, what are we talking about, okay? I mean, are we talking about, because, you know, are we talking about race, are we talking about gender, are we talking about age, are we talking about LGBTQ? I mean, what are we, and what's the relevance to us? Because I think the other thing is, people do not join organizations to have their underlying values and beliefs challenged. Uh, people want to be respected, and I think we share that in common, but people don't want to necessarily, because outside of work, my experience is many people, including myself, pretty much go back to our comfort zones. So how do we look at work as the opportunity and the relevance to what we're working on and what we're about to really see what, you know, what does someone from Bangladesh possibly bring to this? Or what, is, you know, uh, what are two queer w women running this? I mean, how does that lens impact our work? Um, and to really push folks around, you know, what's the relevance of it? Um, and, and folks are really, I think, quite creative if you give them a space, particularly with leaders. And I see a lot of leadership here at SVN, so I think that's a great opportunity is for leaders to step into it uh, despite the discomfort. Well, again, back to leaders, right? I mean, uh, something as simple as uh, we're having a conference and we're encouraging you to bring 
of partners, wives, husbands, whatever, right? I mean, so again, the language we use back to inclusion, just as something as simple as a language. And then what happens once people show up? Do I sort of, again, let's just stick with LGBTQ. Do I watch, you know, the LGBT community just sort of organize over there in the corner, particularly if I'm the leader of the organization? Do I do outreach to sort of role model to others what inclusive behaviors look like? Right? Um, so I just sort of say it because I think the leadership does set the tone for a lot of folks. Because a lot of people are just trying to survive. I love the comment of the uh, yogi this morning. I mean, most people are just caught up in survival. So I think to the extent people can see the relevance of being in these conversations as it augments their own survival, I think is really where that's concerned. Yeah, and I, I just, uh, just to be clear, I, I wasn't saying that you have to choose either one, but there's a difference. And that, and in the same way that, you know, some people are going to have worker-owned businesses and some people aren't. And those are different choices and they're different ethos, period. And so I wasn't, you know, I just, it's, we use things interchangeably, and I think it's important to see that they're, and that they e also contribute to each other, right? Well, and especially inclusion, because inclusion for me are the behaviors one talks about. Diversity are the variables, right? I mean, the system. Yeah, I, I just don't agree right. with you. But well, that, but, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I, but I, uh, yeah, no, absolutely, no, right, exactly. So I just was saying that they're that that they can all exist. They actually can and do all exist, and it, we're not also we're also not talking about one company, right? So it's it's well, right. Whole world, right. Yeah, yeah. So, but that's what I'm saying. One company could have X, and the other company could have Y. Do you know? And and they they they're the sum, they can still create the sum of the and whole. And be in the conversation. And I, yeah. The thing with no, we agree with words, on that. So charged. So I mean, just yeah. in our interactions, mm -hmm. our disagreements. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sharing the space. <laughs> Speak it up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that I, I definitely agree with that. And, and also I think that that's, it's interesting to um, struggle with that as a leader of like how, what does it mean to actually, and as your um, organization grows, how your leadership needs to change. Mm -hmm. and, and I've really, uh, it's, that's been a huge teaching for me. I'm just holding the mic, but I will comment. Um, uh, what I'm going to remember most is everything that you said and this idea of leadership in our community taking this on and creating some kind of a handbook for our own starting here. Yeah, sounds like such a good idea. I, I, I came, I'm, I'm an artist. Well, I didn't know. I was struggling to find a word, a, an initiative, a, a, the idea, it's, it, the honesty, what, what, whatever it takes. Right, right. Yeah. However, however, to to bring this in, in, in uh, yesterday I was at a, um, a, about social uh, 
inclusion, social justice. I, I've been, you know, thinking about starting this company. I'm an artist. It was going to be a paint company. But just the, uh, I, I'm always learning so much um, about what a business really needs to be today. And even though I'm not an employer or anything like that, maybe someday I would be. But just to have this kind of um, awareness of the complexities of what's going on out there. It's, very, it's just very helpful. I'm kind of surprised more people aren't here. Did you, did you talk already? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll cut my observation in half just for you. <laughs> no, but my observation is, is a quick one, and it's just that in my experience, um, the whole discourse around being a social venture can actually lead to a lot of complacency around issues of diversity and inclusion, because I think that um, people consider themselves post-diverse. You know, <laughs> like, uh, I, I'm doing so much good for the world that, and it, it is, um, it's kind of, it has in my experience been an enraging irony that, oh, you know, we're the company that gives away blah, 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 unlike that monster over there, Pratt and Whitney or whatever. And then you find out that in terms of the actual impact on the lives of the thousands of employees, their practices are far better because they do, ha I mean, there are social ventures that don't have affirmative hiring practices. And I find that inexcusable in this network. And like that, I'm sorry, it, it makes me really, I, I feel like there's just no accountability around it. Um, well, first of all, um, just having this session means so much to me. W one of the things that was really probably the best reason why I assumed the role of board chair when I did was the SVN leadership began to recognize how critical diversity and inclusion was going to be important for the future of SVN. Because when you look at statistically, First thing is by 24, just ethnically, by 2043, it's gonna be a majority minority community. So if we're talking about the future of any business, that it became important that it become part of our culture to understand and, do, and be better at inclusion and diversity. Now, so, so when I look at how far the conversation has grown to encompass this conversation, how exciting. But one of the things that I would really um, encourage all of you to do is please carry this conversation outside this room. Take it to other board members who, and there are a couple in this room and take it to the leadership and let them know how important this was for you. I love the comment about how there's this sort of, um, uh, what's the word, righteousness within the community that, oh, that's not as important because we're doing environmental justice, so we're good. You know, and, and, and not being responsible for the social eco-justice factor around inclusion and what that means for our communities. So one of the things that SVN, I know as a board member, we have discussed was broadening our values to more be inclusive of social justice, eco-justice issues. So it's conversations like, we, like, you, like we're having now with your voices that are gonna help fuel that forward because I know that it's an organization that wants to get there. Um, now, one in this I'm gonna, well, I'm, I should end on that. I have a question I'll just ask you on the side, but um, I applaud you, thank you, and um, I learned a lot today. Thank you for the speakers.
I want to thank everyone who showed up here, because I do think this was a, an important beginning, and I'm going to cede to Denise that, yes, it's an opportunity. We have a huge, huge opportunity. And um, I actually want to offer myself up as a clearinghouse for ideas. And so if anyone has some thoughts coming out of this discussion about uh, how we might affect change in this community around this issue, I would really appreciate you sending them to me um, and rest assured that they will wind up before our board. Um, and, and I do think actually the affirmative hiring policy issue is one I want to really encourage us to wonder about. Um, because that for me is, is, is incredibly disturbing. And uh, I, I would like you to wrap your heads around the fact that there are so many organizations and companies involved in SVN who actually do not have an affirmative hiring policy. If you were to see their corporate picture, you'd be shocked. Or maybe not. And maybe that's the problem. So um, please feel free to send me any ideas. And thank you so much for being here, for starting this conversation. And, and let's make sure that we carry it forward. Thank you.